Thank you very much for introduction. Uh, dear Mr. Dean, Mr. Wise Dean, Scientific Council members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to tell you a bit about the research that uh, we carry out in a research group and about mobile networks. I'm pretty sure that uh, all of you got in touch with mobile networks on a daily basis. But still, uh, I would like to briefly outline architecture of mobile networks because this is something that is not so well known and it will help me to motivate the uh, other part of the talk and also it will indicate scope of our research. So, mobile network is composed of two major parts. Core network, it's something what the uh, common public cannot easily see because it's somewhere in operator's premises. And uh, the other part is radio access network, including mainly base stations. This provides connectivity through radio interface to communicating devices in terminology of uh, standardization. Those are user equipment. <coughs> and scope of our research is related to radio access network and management and control of the communication and mobility of the users. We don't deal much with core network. And historically, since the beginning of mobile networks, communication was designed so that if one user equipment is willing to communicate with another one, the data or information is sent through radio interface to base station, then it goes to core network, and then it returns to the user, either through the same base station or another base station, depending on the position of users. And even if the users are close to each other, this is the way or root of uh, data. So if I would be exchanging data with anybody in this room, the data would go out to base station, to core network, and then return back. This seems to be quite inefficient, right? And therefore, in 2015, uh, Mobile networks were extended by a new feature known as device-to-device -device communication that allows direct exchange of data between two devices without direct interve intervention of base station or core network. Uh, this extension allows to increase throughput. Here, the red line is with uh, the D2D D communication, device-to-device -device communication enabled. The blue line is traditional way through base station. And we can also reduce communication latency because data goes directly between two devices and data doesn't have to go to base station core network and back. At the same time, if devices are close to each other, we can set lower transmitting power and save energy. Of course, these benefits are at the cost of more complex uh, devices, and even if this feature is in standard, it's not well deployed yet in practice, but in the future, I believe it will be. Device-to-device -device communication also complicates a bit management of communication resources, because uh, we not only need to think about which channel, what time the users should communicate, but we should also uh, think about transmitting power in order to avoid interference to other concurrent communications. And uh, we should uh, decide whether direct con communication is beneficial or if we sh should follow traditional way. We can even send data through intermediate device in between. So we can relay communication through multiple hops. And to manage all these aspects well, we should know channel quality. And we don't talk about channel quality between these two devices only, but also channels to base station and all channels to other devices in, in the area. So if we have multiple devices around, we should also think about channels among all devices because of potential interference that would degrade quality of service for communicating devices. And to acquire information about channel quality, we need to measure channel, and the measurement consists of transmission of reference signal, its reception, processing, and reporting the quality back to transmitter or to base station, depending who is in charge of, of the control. And it's uh, quite... Uh, it's related to quite heavy signaling, because we need to basically measure quality of the number of channels, which is proportional to square number of devices. Uh, so for high number of devices, uh, we could end up in the situation that we would measure all the time. And 
resources that we use for channel quality measurement are from the same pool of resources that we use for communication. So we have frequency and time domains, resources, and those blue are for data, the rest is for measurement, or those red are for measurement and reporting. And the more we measure, the more resources we consume. And in theory, we could end up in a situation when we just measure and we have no resources for communication. In practice, of course, this is not possible, but in theory, it could be like this. And uh, measurement itself not only costs us radio resources, but it takes time, it costs energy. So the question is whether there is a way how to acquire channel quality information in a more efficient way. And to illustrate you uh, the way we proposed, let's start from a very simple scenario uh, where we have these two users. We are interested in quality of this channel. We would like to know it. And this base station in the middle provides uh, connectivity to both users. So in normal way, these two users would communicate through this base station. Then we have some neighboring base stations around. And what we know always is the channel quality to, to the serving base station is the one with which users communicate in traditional way. This is something that is known to network. We also know, in most of the cases, uh, channel quality to neighboring base stations. And in ideal scenario, with homogeneous channels, no obstacles, nothing, we could uh, simply take channel quality to three base stations for each user. And from this, we could determine position of users. And knowing that the channel is homogeneous, we could uh, extract the uh, quality of this channel directly. Unfortunately, uh, such scenario with absolutely no obstacles, no borders, nothing is not realistic in practice. So that's why this approach is not even published uh, in literature, because simply it's useless. So let's see more practical, realistic scenario. We have same base stations, uh, same users, but now we have some obstacles in between buildings, trees, whatever. And in such case, unfortunately, there is no explicit relation between this channel and uh, all other channels to base stations. Uh, we came up with the idea to apply machine learning, more specifically deep neural networks, uh, to learn something about the environment and uh, being able to predict channel quality between two devices. So deep neural network is uh, fed with uh, channel qualities of individual users to neighboring base stations, and it predicts uh, channel quality. And not very surprisingly, in ideal scenario, it's this top line, uh, there is no difference in uh, system communication capacity if we use DNN-based channel quality prediction and uh, real measured channel quality uh, for the algorithm that is used for channel allocation. So we, take, uh, we took a channel allocation algorithm that we proposed, we uh, fed it with, with predicted and with uh, real measured channel qualities, and it leads to the same system capacity. So it indicates that uh, DNN can work well in ideal environment, but it's not surprising. More surprising is that it works even in a more realistic scenario with uh, obstacles deployed in the area. We tested it for two deployments of buildings in the area, and for both the capacities using predicted using DNN were very close to those uh, using real measurements. And it, it indicates that the channel quality is predicted accurately enough to be applied to, to practical algorithms. And the main benefit is that uh, while this is number of uh, channel quality measurements and reporting for traditional way over the number of communicating devices, increasing uh, with square of the number of devices roughly, the proposed uh, algorithm leads to linear dependency. So it's applicable even for scenarios with more users in the environment, and thus it's promising for future mobile networks. Another way how to extend mobile networks beyond D2D -D communication is to consider relaying. I already mentioned that uh, obstacles in communication always make us troubles. And for example, if we have users that are behind a building, channel quality from uh, 
common base station is degraded because of this obstacle. So the signal is attenuated and users may suffer from lower throughput, for example. This is, of course, uh, not good. And traditional way how to solve it is either deploy another base station or relay station. A relay station is a bit simplified base station. It's a bit cheaper. Uh, but the problem is that if you deploy one relay here, in mobile networks, users can move. And they can move behind another building. So we would need another relay to be deployed or another base station. And we can end up with a relay or base station on every building or every lamp post. This is uh, not practical because the deployment cost of mobile networks is significant. So the possible solution might be to deploy communication equipment, base station, on a drone or UAV in general, and create flying base station in the literature, sometimes known as aerial base stations, for example. And this uh, flying base station relays communication between users and base stations, and it adapts its position according to users' requirements on communication. So as the users move or, or as they change requirements on communication, the drone can follow them. Uh, this is practical, especially in scenarios, for example, in the rural area, you can imagine there is a suburb area or rural area with low density of population, maybe hundreds of people living there commonly, but then there is a football stadium or any other stadium. This is attended by thousands of people every week. So the infrastructure which is built for conventional case without these people attending stadium is simply not enough to serve mass of people coming once per week or even less often. So building infrastructure that would be able to serve thousands of people is not efficient. It's very expensive and infrastructure is not used most of the time. So it's just getting outdated. And uh, sending drone or flying base station just for the purpose of uh, serving users during, before and after the match or a concert or any other event seems to be very efficient. And we demonstrated that uh, one UAV can replace several small base stations while still providing users with the same channel quality and even reducing uh, energy consumed by the user equipment, by mobile phones, for example, because users communicate with device which is closer to them. Of course, overall network energy consumption is increased because we should account also energy for flying, which might be high. But still, th this is a quite interesting solution. We got Best Paper Award to the conference for this idea. And uh, we further develop it towards uh, uh, improvement of relaying. There are two types of relaying. The first one is known as tra non-transparent relaying in terminology of uh, standards for mobile networks is type 1 relaying. In standardization, they like these notations like type 1 and type 2, which is quite confusing, but they do it. So non-transparent relays are simpler than base station, but still quite complicated, and they perform most of the functionalities as common base station. So they handle communication, they allocate resources for served users, and they manage uh, all the signaling for the users. The second type, transparent relays, don't care about signaling and control of the communication at all. They simply boost data for users, but control information and signaling comes from the base station directly to the users. Uh, this allows to make uh, transparent relays cheaper, less complex, thus less en energy con consuming, and uh, this makes them also very convenient for flying base stations. Unfortunately, in 2008 or around this year, in the process when these were supposed to be standardized and included in standards, uh, it was discovered that no signaling and no control functionalities at uh, transparent relay leads to problems with association of the users because we are not able to measure channel quality. All the information regarding channel quality measurement comes from base station. So we know this channel, we don't know this channel. And it doesn't allow us to associate users to write base station or to relay. And if we don't know channels to individual users, we cannot allocate resources 
very well. So this was one of the reasons why transparent relays were uh, dropped from the standardization process and are not included. But what we can do, we can think about this relay and treat it as device, and then we can apply the solution that we propose for D2D channel quality prediction using DNN. So we can predict channel quality between this device and this relay, is treated as, as device, as long as we have some base stations around. And we did so, uh, we integrated with it with algorithm for association of the users to either ground base stations or flying base stations, and to also determine position of the drones. And we showed that uh, we can significantly improve uh, system capacity with respect to state-of-the-art works, it's this line, and those are variants of our proposal. So we can gain dozens of percent uh, in system capacity. Another way how to extend mobile networks goes a bit beyond traditional communication. And it's about clouds. Not clouds on the sky, but clouds in terms of cloud computing. And uh, you know that uh, originally mobile phones were designed to transmit voice, then text messages, later on data, and now Many people use mobile phones rather as small computer in their pocket or maybe in a backpack if they have a larger phone. Uh, there are plenty of interesting and entertaining applications on mobile phones, but these require powerful CPU in the phone. And if you have application which is demanding in terms of computation, then you have to pay with your battery, with energy. And battery is depleted quickly, then you have to recharge, which is quite annoying for common users. So how to allow complicated and computationally demanding applications to be run on mobile phone and don't spend too much energy in battery? The first idea is to take at least a part of computing and move it somewhere else. The first way was to move it to some centralized cloud. The problem of classical cloud computing is that you have huge farm of servers in per country, for example. So one is in Germany, one in France. And uh, these are, from the topology of the mobile network perspective, quite far from the users, and it leads to high latency. So you can forget about real-time applications to be handled this way. So we should think about what's the closest place to the users where we could deploy some computing resources. And in mobile networks, it's base station. So distributing computing resources across the edge of mobile network represented by base stations leads to a concept which is today known as multi-access edge computing. Before it was mobile edge computing, and when we started working on it, it was femtocloud or small cell cloud terminology evolved. And this concept allows to reduce uh, delay for processing of uh, applications and or to preserve battery in mobile devices. And to prove this concept, we have developed an uh, application of augmented reality that basically discovered points of interest around user. And there, was heavy, uh, there is heavy computation behind this discovery of points of interest. And the larger area we searched through the higher complexity of computation. We developed the application so that it can be, or its part can be offloaded to an edge server, and we demonstrated that it can really reduce latency between starting the process of computation of discovery of points of interest till we get results by means of lists of uh, points of interest, and at the same time, we can save a lot of energy. Uh, we presented this uh, demo at several places. We got the bronze medal at ACA Mobicom conference, for example, then we presented it in the European Telecommunication Standardization Institute. And uh, of course, we continued this work for a few years after, and we optimized it because this first demo was without any advanced optimizations. So this was about my past work. Now let me briefly outline future plans and research directions. And to do so, I will start with this, uh, this illustration that you maybe know from 
magazines, uh, because recently when 5G networks were uh, deployed, this was quite well uh, presented in media. And it, it indicates parameters that each network should reach in order to be, for example, 4G. And that's the time when I started my research career as a PhD student. And I was contributing mainly to mobility and data rates aspects. Then uh, for 5G, the parameters increased in each uh, dimension. And uh, this was a uh, key part of my career. Now I work, not surprisingly, on 6G. In 10 years, it would be maybe 7G, I don't know. Uh, but for 6G, we don't know yet what the targeted values will be. It's currently under discussion. We should know the values around 2027 when the standardization should start. And now I will try to outline how to reach potential values for 6G. I told that we don't know exact values, but we know that in each dimension there, there is expected some improvement. The values I included here are just somehow taken from literature, but the different papers uh, present different values. Now it's under discussion of research community and industry and potential users. And I will present future directions from my perspective, so I will not uh, cover whole spectrum of potential improvements towards 6G. So the first uh, thing we will continue is uh, focus on radio resource management combined with uh, management of cloud computing resources. Most likely, these algorithms will be based on artificial intelligence, on machine learning, uh, because it seems the traditional approaches are simply too complex for networks with many base stations and many communicating devices. Then another topic is related to non-terrestrial networks. I already mentioned that we did some work on UAVs uh, serving as base stations. And uh, we, and I foresee that uh, extension towards high altitude platforms and satellites, uh, future directions. Very recently I, I attended a workshop of European Space Agency when, where they were talking about this concept and they were presenting it to members of CG Industry Association for potential collaboration. And key challenges to cope with are related to latency, because if you go far away from the ground to space, the latency is inevitable. We have to cope with it uh, only through uh, considering low altitude flying base stations. Uh, another issue is related to channel quality and uh, interference, because if the communication goes from satellite, it will be most likely strongly attenuated, and the level of signal from satellite at the ground will be most likely much below the level of signal from traditional base station, which is close to the users. And an interesting topic seems to be also deployment of distributed cloud computing in form of edge computing to individual nodes in the scenario for purposes of uh, application processing as well as for management of communication. And the second topic I would like to mention is uh, based on semantic communication. It's a relatively new concept. And uh, before this concept, most of the research works were about how to improve communication capacity of channel. But it was absolutely disconnected from the content and purpose of the communication. Semantic communication brings new aspect of why do we communicate, what do we want to say, what do we want to deliver, what do we want to do. So we care about purpose and meaning of the information that is being transmitted. And there is quite strong theory behind this. It's well elaborated. And where I see potential future research is to integrate this aspect again with cloud computing and optimize jointly resources for computing and communication considering that uh, considering semantic meaning of, meaning of the information that we transmit and consider also multiple modalities. As an example, you can imagine a scenario in a factory where you have some production line. There is 
product that is monitored, there are sensors, maybe you take a picture of it, and then you send all this information somewhere to process and uh, decide whether the product is good or bad. And uh, if all these information are related to one object, most likely there will be some overlap in information, so you don't need to transmit everything. So one challenge is to decide what should be transmitted to avoid redundancy, and how to transmit it, and how to process it, so that you don't waste radio and computing resources. So that's the end of my presentation. Here you can see brief characteristic uh, of myself as requested by, by the faculty. And I would like to first thanks to my colleagues from the team, from the department, from the faculty and university, and also colleagues from abroad, with whom I work a lot. And thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much for interesting lecture on how we communicate and transfer data in future mobile networks. And now I open the lecture for the discussion and ask the audience for uh, asking a questions. Uh, Professor Matas. Okay, thank you for the lecture. I have two related questions. One is related to these deep networks. How many inputs are there? If you have two base stations, you input two numbers? No. For each user, you need at least three base stations. We, we tested how many. Okay, you can okay, input so you more. Okay, so have a network which has three inputs. No, it's for each user. Okay, but so you let's say about with the example when you have a s okay. So you have two. Okay, but these things are you, you don't try to regress the position of the user. You try to use this. As, uh, so I thought it was a pairwise relationship, and I thought maybe incorrectly that you regress the position of the user, and then from something you estimate. So it's it's like a pairwise relationship now, so it doesn't care, it's, it's pairwise, two users, yes. you don't, if there are seven users, you do it pairwise. Yes. yes. Okay, so, so you have, and each, so if you don't have three base stations, you can't, so you input six numbers. Yes. And you have a six numbers which are, uh, which go through a deep neural network. Uh, could okay. you give me like how deep it is and how many yes, million uh, okay. parameters <laughs> you have? Maybe. Uh, it's uh, for this case, if I'm not wrong, it was uh, five hidden layers. Five With hidden about layers? About 20 neurons per layer, maybe a bit less. Okay, so a couple of probably tens of thousands, yeah. maybe something, that, uh, maybe thousand parameters from six numbers. It's a pretty complex function of six variables. Okay, okay, so yes. And the second thing, is it realistic that someone will standardize um, that here and there the devices will send their GPS position or no? That's always complicated, yeah. Uh, GPS position is private information, and sharing private... Okay, okay, forget about that. So let's say I'm a user, I'm ready to put it, and I'll get better service if I'm okay. ready to allow it. So I switched it on, and I enabled my device to, to transmit it, because I believe I'll benefit with better communication in the vicinity. I'm in a football stadium, and if I do yeah. that, I, um, I will have a better communication. So yep. will it happen or can it happen or what is the... What is it, the it can help. We even did experiments when uh, one of the users shared its position and we redo the same stuff. It slightly improved performance, but not much. But will it happen? Is it realistic that it will happen? Because you are showing examples when you have houses between the base like stations and, and the devices. The but if the devices are within reasonable distance, which I assume, there is very high likelihood that there will be no obstacle between them. It's something like if I'm... Uh, you, you can think about, maybe uh, your question is more about use cases, right? Uh, you, you can think about communication of vehicles, for example. It's one of the use cases. But I'm, I'm going towards the standard. Is the standard going to ever allow, as part of the standard, for devices which will allow it to share GPS location to simplify this thing? Well, uh, I don't know. It's a question to standardization body, which encompasses all the industry related to communication at all. So far, you know, I was in standard in this standardization body. It's three GPP third generation partnership project. I was representing this university for four years in this body, and my feeling was that they are not very open to such stuff. Okay. But uh, I quit my involvement in 2017, so maybe stuff's changed. But in general, uh, they are not very open to, to this. Thank you. Uh, Professor Havran. Uh, it was a nice lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I am a naive 
but I will ask a question. This is a complex function, so basically you decided to use neural networks. But in case you don't want to use neural networks, you should be able to formulate it analytically as, let's say, many integrals, because it's, every, it's about uh, signal attenuation, yeah, and please don't. Yeah, but you don't know it. Uh, yeah, but in case, I mean, in case you know the geometry and uh, some attenuation. Well, if you would know exactly the environment, yeah. if you would have perfect model of environment, then you might be able to model channels but it would be of so huge complexity that I cannot but imagine. But anyway, like neural networks is basically approximating some functions. Yes. And you, done, you basically don't take care about the, let's say, the best um, formulation of this function when you just use it. Yeah? That's, this is like a kind of not uh, clear to me if, because, because then you have some theoretical ground, truth, yeah? computed by electromagnetic waves and all that, and you approximate it by neural networks, but I would like to know uh, the formulation which is that ground true. Yeah, is this, what, was, that, was that done or...? Do ah, you ask it? about this uh, true real measured values. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it, could, could, should be computable as well. Yeah. It, it, it is computable. Uh, there are ray tracing methods to model uh, channel, pr channel propagation or signal propagation, but it's uh, very complicated and uh, it's not also accurate. Uh, how we did it, uh, we, it's done through simulations, and then now we are uh, experimentally verifying it in the lab where we have real mm -hmm. values from the network in the laboratory. Yeah. So it's small-scale network, one floor in this building. So we have real values measured in that environment. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Th th this is uh, this ground true for us. Yeah. And but no, not in this case, this was done for simulations. Mm -hmm. and in, in case you have massive data, you should be also able to invert the, the problem because you could be able to deduce the geometry from, of the buildings from the attenuation of the signals. If you sort would of. have enough data, if yeah. you would be able to create a perfect map of the signals with multiple layers corresponding you to different positions of users. You have a lot of, of time users. moving mobile phones with many people you know the positions of, of the yeah, but base you, stations. You can still have new positions, new new. Yeah, yes, cases. sure, but it's kind of interesting. But uh, there is no such solution published or even okay. adopted Thank in you the network. So. Thank you. And Professor Matas again. So I assume that this um, DOD communication is realistic when the two devices are much nearer than the base station. Or relative distance is quite small. It's related to distance in general, yeah. Yeah. So I thought you should actually do. Uh, I was thinking all the time that you you try to estimate the position and the distance is is a good estimate. And actually, if it's not, you don't want to use it. So no, nobody cares. But, but yeah, so if you your your devices will have to be near. And if they are not near, forget it. If they are near, it might work or not. If it doesn't work, use the base station. Uh, so we have a two D problem. Pro is that uh, the distance? Okay. Usually, if we talk about D2D communication, we talk about dozens of meters, maybe 50, 100 meters yes. maximum. It could be even more in the rural areas, because in the rural areas, uh, uh, radius of base station coverage can be mm -hmm. several kilometers. So D2D could be beneficial even for hundreds of meters. Yes. Yeah. But then, uh, obstacles are not the only problem. Maybe I simplif simplified it too much, but also reflections from other no, stuff no, no, around no, might you, be problem. You didn't get the idea. What I'm saying, if you know the position, then you know the distance. If it's far, forget it. Don't connect them. If they are, and then you make the, the assumption, you, if they are near, it might work, then you try, because how will you do this? How will you establish the I, communication? I, I do understand you. If you would know position of both users, you can say, okay, these are close to each other. There are potential try. candidates. Try. Don't yeah. model anything in 6D. But and that's uh, it. Then if you try, it takes you, again, time, because you need to send something to see whether it works or not. This one try is much simpler than a 6D unreliable function, which has to be trained on many things. I'm not sure about it. Maybe for two devices it could be, but if you would have plenty of devices and for each pair you would be trying, and you, you talk only about uh, th this direct channel, but as I mentioned here, you have interfering channels. So you need to care also about interference because... But you have to try anyway. You have to try anyway. You are, uh, you I, I know you can be inaccurate. You yeah, will sure. not connect two users without trying that it works. You will not d connect them based on your 6D network. It's unrealistic what you are saying. You will try. But you will not, you are phoning to someone and then you connect them 
through a DOD and it stops working, maybe you have 2% chance, but you will not do that. You will try whether yeah. the communication... Uh, the, that's true, but the, in, you know, in mobile networks, and everything is uncertain because we don't know that they are fast fading, that are, that are absolutely unpredictable. So we always have to account for some uh, potential problems and okay. errors. Okay, I'll leave you there. But I understand your point, uh, <laughs> but it's maybe too, too random. Professor Kibit. Okay, thank, thank you for a nice... <laughs> Thank you for a nice presentation. I have another, uh, okay. Uh, artificial intelligence was the only part that, that uh, I know of, so that I, I will focus on the same thing. So you said that uh, like the, uh, the properties of the space, they change, for example, if there is audience or no audience. And people are moving around, there are new people coming in. So the situation changes. And then you are saying you have interference in between other people who can be phoning at the same time. So the situation changes all the time. So did you consider uh, updating your predictor, like learning online yeah. from the current measurement, relearning your function in order to, well, track the situation? Thank you. Uh, in fact, what we did, I have not included the uh, figure here, but what we tested, uh, let me maybe show this again. So what we did, we train everything and then we insert something what we call moving objects like vehicles, for example, that enters the situation and we run uh, everything again to see what's the impact. Surprisingly, the impact uh, on capacity was not so significant. It was about a few percent degradation. But uh, what you just mentioned, possibility to update predictions and maybe somehow update uh, ne uh, neural network. It's something w what is definitely possible. We didn't do it. We have not do it uh, so far, but it's uh, in a plan <laughs> for us. Any other questions? Uh, may maybe I have one. Uh, you uh, showed us a comparison of uh, measured channel quality and estimated using, using uh, machine learning approaches. Uh, did you use a particular frequency? The 5G band is a very wide band, up yeah. to 60 uh, gigahertz, and it might be different at lower uh, Might be, but accuracy, you know, the, those channels, that doesn't matter whether it is 2.6 or 26 gigahertz, like, of course. Absolute values are different, but behavior is somehow similar. There are analogies. This was done for some traditional frequencies, I think, to mo most likely 2.6. I'm not 100% sure, but 2.6 or maybe 3.5 yeah. 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 gigahertz. Yes. The, the okay. higher the frequency, the attenuation is uh, yeah, higher. The, the, the higher is the attenuation, the yeah. more significant are uh, interferences of the signals. So if you would measure it at 60, uh, Gigahertz, it uh, might it, be it, it's not uh, 60 gigahertz is not uh, yet uh, allowed for <laughs> for mobile networks maximum I think it's yeah. 26 or uh -huh. we can ask uh, colleagues from mobile uh, operators yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you welcome uh, do we have any other questions if not thank you very much again the presenter and the audience for asking your questions